Um, just a reminder that um, here next week, um, our, su our uh, regular Sunday school classes uh, come to an end and we go into our summer Sunday school and we really need some help um, just kind of watching the kids and uh, teaching them because God never sleeps and the only way the kids know that is if we tell them and so we really need some help so if you can sign up for just one Sunday the sign up is on the back there so please do that. A reminder, next week we have just one service at 10 o'clock as we welcome Glory Way to come and um, do a music presentation for us. We're going to worship through music, um, so uh, don't come at 8.30 because maybe nobody will be here at 8.30. I don't know, but I'm just t uh, reminding you. Uh, and I think that's it. that's it. So we have our noisy collection. So let's get out your change, your dollar bills, your ten dollar bills, and um, worship for that. Oh, and it's for Vacation Bible School. So yes. Ready, set, here we go. Heading out around the globe, sights to see, things to know, the incredible race. Texas to Timbuktu, follow us back to a building crew. The great big story of me and you, the incredible race. We've got a whole world to see, the incredible race. So won't you come with me, the incredible race. God's plans for you and me. And start our worship by singing to the Lord. <clears throat> Jerry, get up here. God is 
is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, His light will shine. God is good. God is good. God is good. He's so good. God is good. He's so good all the time. Amen. And they were singing out there, Susan. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I worship Your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh Worship your holy name. Yes, I will worship your holy name. Lord, I will worship your holy name. And you may be seated. 
Today, we are privileged to have Charlene with us, and Charlene is our lay delegate, our representative to the annual conference, and um, she is here to give us a report on everything that happened at the annual conference. Well, not everything, but yeah, the, the major <laughs> things. That would be many hours long. First of all, I'd like to indeed thank all of you at Prospect Street United Methodist Church for allowing me to have the opportunity to go as a lay delegate from this church to represent us, to uh, vote on the issues, to be there and uh, commune with so many of our United Methodist Fellows. The theme for this year at West Ohio Conference, and you can see the sign there, so proud to see that every time we walked up to Hoover Auditorium. The theme was, Be Not Afraid, Hope. And this was taken from the verse from Roman 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hope indeed was heard throughout the conference for many times as we had our voting and different uh, things happening, they had people that were just lay people coming up and witnessing and speaking about the hope that the United Methodist Church has given them. They spoke of their lives, of alcohol, of uh, being homeless, being in prison. Hope then that was met when they had seen a United Methodist person joined the congregation, and now had lives filled with hope for now and for eternity. There were 2,000 representatives there at the conference, and I myself had lots of hope in finding Pastor Therese and her friend Karen <laughs> throughout the congregation. About half the time we were able to meet up. We had a spot, and sometimes I got there, sometimes I didn't. There were four recommendations to the conference to discuss and to vote on. Issue number one was the 2020 budget narrative for recommendation. This recommendation was for the apportionment of $19,572, of which 15% went for the districts and 85% for the conference and then the general church ministries. This is another reduction then of 2.5% versus what it was in 2019. So we were applauding this apportionment of reduction again. The board stated that a shared financial commitment would be provided then for missions and ministry in the West Ohio di district and local areas and throughout the world. Recommendation one also included the missional church development with Light the Way campaign. They had hats, they had pens, they had bags, and this campaign is to revitalize and offer grants, providing churches with resources for new growth and vitality. Issue one of the budget was voted on and approved by majority. Issue two, was a recommendation of the pension and health benefits. The conference board recommended to give this investment company called Westpath Investments and Benefits to establish and maintain a pension program for the ordained full-time ministers, their families, church workers, and lay employers. So that would be such as Mike and as Erica. Healthcare benefits were shown in this chart, and I've got it right here. If any of you want to look in more in depth, I will have this in church. You can go ahead and look at it. This is also on page 35 in this big book that we were given. The chart, chart showed a coverage with premium payments of shared costs for church and participants. Issue two with the pension and health benefits was also voted on by the 2,000 members approved by majority. Issue three was a commission on equitable compensation. This showed a projection for 2020 with the minimum salaries for elders in full appointment, 
to the licensed local pastors. And I also have a little chart. I'm not going to read all these numbers because they are lengthy. Here's a chart right here if anyone wants to look at the book to get more in depth about this. It shows also 25% going for housing and parsonages, which we have, of course, or in housing allowances, and this issue was voted on and approved by majority. And throughout the amendments that we had to vote on, we had times of worship, times of praise, we had communion, we had times of fellowship. Pastor Bishop had, uh, Palmer had talked about the United Methodist Church. Where are we going? Where are we heading? About concerns, and we've had those concerns as well. But throughout the conference, the words of hope came through. Hope for the United Methodist Church. Hope that we would be revitalized. Hope to remain strong. Recommendation 4 showed a petition to amendment with paragraph 316.1 in the Book of Disciplines. This paragraph was for clarification of the context of ministry regarding licensed clergy. The concerns were for their responsibilities and duties of those that were in smaller churches. Also in petition for this was a recommendation of the wordings in the Book of Discipline on page on 319.2. It would be changed from them meeting annually by the district committee to that of the local pastors without meeting in person and committees unless requested by the committee. It was stated, and for this, there are lots of concerns for, lots of concerns against, and of course, this was for an amendment. But it was stated that the Book of Discipline says they must be annually recommended to affirm with local pastors and engage in council together. After much debate, this petition then would be changed to the book and it was voted on and not amended. One highlight for me in the conference is the service of commission, ordination, and retirement. Seeing the banners that go by with those that are ordained is just fantastic. Can't imagine the colors, the verses, the charges to go out into the world. It is just one beautiful sight to see as we're all singing Raise the Banner High. And for me, hope indeed was evident when the family of the Martindales walked up through the podium, up to the stage, and witnessed the full eldership of Josh Martindale, who was here, a young boy, and we took part in his forming of Christian life. So we at Prospect Street United Methodist Church can be proud to serve in the role in aiding those and to continue to do that. With the closing remarks of Bishop Palmer, he stated that nothing is worth doing that cannot be accomplished in a life not saved by hope. Hope in Jesus Christ. We indeed have a God who offers salvation, forgiveness, and fills us with the United Methodist hope of peace for here, now, and for eternity. As the conference was closing, we heard about the hope of the plans for Lakeside. The uh, head of the Lakeside uh, Corporation got up and spoke and said there are 150,000 people that have been served through the past summers and are hoping again for that return as well. Projects that they have had and the Lakeside uh, playground area, sporting area is just beautiful. They have a new bandstand they have spent 450000 on youth programs and on sports. They have a new pickleball court. The new pool, which was in place last year, is just gorgeous, but now they have a little restaurant, La Lago Restaurant, right beside that. They have put the old school that has been there for years and years and years into use for performing arts with music programs that are going to be aided by the Lake Site Orchestra. And with all, Lakeside has $1,000 pledges 
given to our district, the Ohio, West Ohio, for district relief and disasters. The time at Lakeside is a time of wondering where we are going as a church, but it is a time of hope, knowing that we united together will remain that way, will remain strong for Jesus Christ. Thank you very much for allowing me to go and hope again for another good year next year. Thank you. Charlene, thank you. And uh, of course, we did vote. I've already said that Tuesday was the whole day voting for our delegates. And I meant to, I was supposed to have a paper with all their names on so we could pray over that. I forgot. I will have that next week. Totally my fault. I know. Blame me. It's, it is all my fault. So <clears throat> I should, Charlene, I would have it, and then I forgot. So, um, But let us remember those who are preparing to go to our annual conference next um, next uh, May, and we will see what happens after that, right? But in the meantime, this church remains. We remain strong because, we, uh, because Jesus Christ leads us. So let's go to our time of prayer. <coughs> oh, before we do that, I should announce the prayers, shouldn't I? Sorry. Remember the Ryder family. <coughs> Ken told me today that his brother, uh, Gerald, is it Gerald or Gerald? Gerald, sorry. Gerald um, had uh, collapsed, and um, they took him to the hospital and found out that he had kidney stones. His blood, blood pressure has been dropping. So he was in the hospital because of kidney stones. And in the meantime, his wife found out that she had a broken kneecap, and so her leg is immobilized, and none of their kids are close, so her sister came down to help them. So um, remember them. They are here in Marion. Ben's very good friend, John Larkin, um, who does have diabetes, had an infection in his toe. They rushed him into surgery, removed the toe and part of inside of the foot. Um, he's very lucky to be alive, but he is. So let us remember him and his recovery. And let us remember um, the cooks, especially Linda, um, not only looking after Dale, but also her mom is now in uh, Toledo. Is that right? And uh, she had to have surgery on her leg. She had a broken femur that nobody detected, and she's been walking on it. Um, she's been in a lot of pain and couldn't really tell anyone. So um, let us remember Linda. She's in Arizona and not knowing where she should be or uh, what a terrible decision to have to make. Now let us go to the Lord in prayer. God, our Father, we're very quick to bring complaints to you, to bring our prayer requests to you. But we are reminded today that, yes, in you, we always have hope. So, Lord, I, I want to thank you for the hope, the hope we have in our own lives, minute to minute, day to day, and the hope we have as a church of continuing to be the light of Jesus Christ in our own community. Lord, thank you for those who show us hope, who remind us daily that we can go on. There is a better world, not just in heaven where we're hoping to go, but here on earth because with you, there is always hope. Lord, we lift up to you the prayer requests we've spoken. Once again, Lord, we lift up to you all the farmers around, especially the Midwest, who are battling the weather, trying to get crops in, and praying that the crops they do have in survive. Lord, this will affect the economy of all people. So, Lord, we pray for the weather to be able to enable the crops to grow. We pray for those who have been battling and continue to battle destruction by natural means, water, tornadoes, those still suffering the um, 
aftermath of hurricanes and cyclones. Lord, we pray that each of us can listen to the stories of others who have had everything that they own destroyed. Lord, our world is somewhat in chaos. Things are changing and we don't know how to handle it. So Lord, let us lean on you, the never changing, always present God, who loves us for who we are. Lord, we give you the thanks and the praise today. And now let us lift up the prayer that Jesus taught us as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. You are the I'm continuing my quest to bring back the music of the 60s with one of your countrymen, Jackie DeShannon. You know this song, you can sing along. Hit it, Ben. Okay, it's loading. 
Think of your fellow man, lend him a helping hand, put a little love in your heart. You see it's getting late, oh please don't hesitate, put a little love in your heart, and the world will be a better place, and the world will be a better place for you. Just wait and see. Another day goes by, and still the children cry. Put a little love in your heart. If you want the world to know, we won't let hatred grow. Put a little love in your heart, and the world will be a better place and the world will be a better place for you and me you just wait and see place and the world will be a better place for you and me you just wait and see Thank you, Anne. <clears throat> Put a little love in your heart. What a great way to start off reading scripture. If you're able, please stand with me as uh, this, we read the scripture this morning from 1 Kings 19, 1 through 9. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. 
There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? This is the word of God from long ago for the people of God today. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Lord, as we sit in this peaceful sanctuary, many of us, our minds are just reeling. The things that we have to do, or the place that we find ourselves right now. Maybe it's financial worries. Maybe it's worries about our job. Maybe it's worries about family. Lord, help us to put that aside as we put ourselves in Elijah's place. Lord, speak to us today so we can know where we're headed and not where we are right now. In your name we pray, amen. (laughs) I'm tired. I did not want to get up this morning. If I'm perfectly honest with you, after the alarm went off twice, I'd rather have turned over, turned it off, and gone right back to sleep. In fact, I didn't want to come to church, let alone preach. Have you ever been there? Not the fact that you have to preach. I'm talking about just not wanting to get up, not wanting to face whatever it is you have in that day. This last week, I didn't get my day off I was at a training for three days. They gave us homework. How dare they? And I was up till after midnight trying to make sure it was as perfect as I could make it, but it's never perfect. I got home, did washing, and had a wedding rehearsal. Got up early Saturday and came to the breakfast. Went home, did more sermon prep, and then had the wedding. Now, I'm not here really complaining. What I'm saying is that I know just how vulnerable we can be to the world when we have been working and working and going and going and we're tired, just like Elijah in our story today. So let's see what Elijah was going through because we face the same things. And the dangers that Elijah faced, we face too. How can we prevent that from happening? So right before our scripture begins, Jezebel, uh, I'm sorry, um, Elijah has demonstrated God's great power by inviting the Baal prophets to sacrifice. And he gave them all day to call upon their God. And he made fun of their God because the uh, not using any fire, their sacrifices did not burn up. Then at the end of the day, Elijah, just to pour it on, puts water all over his sacrifice and on the wood and in the trenches around it. And then he prays. And God sends fire down from heaven that burns not only the sacrifice, but laps up all the water as well really made fun of those Baal prophets. And then Elijah said, quickly, round up those prophets and kill every single one of them, which they did. Through the power of God, which Elijah believed in 100% or it wouldn't have happened, he defeated 400 Baal prophets. And then... It hadn't rained for seven years because people had been following them. And he said to to King Ahab, look out, the rain is coming. You better get back home, otherwise you're going to get stuck in the mud. And he went up on a mountain and he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed. And eventually, here comes the tiniest cloud on the horizon, and rain came to the land. God then gave him the power to pick up his robes, the scripture says, and to run ahead of King Ahab, who was in a chariot, to to, uh, Jezreel, (coughs) where where he lived, to be able able to make sure that the story was told right. 
And King Ahab runs to his wife, Jezebel, and tells her what happened. It's amazing. If I mention the name King Ahab, many of you say, who the heck is he? But if I mention the name Jezebel, you know who she is, right? Ahab was the king, and Jezebel, his wife, she actually had a lower role, but we know more about her because she influenced her husband, the king, so much. No one should have that much power over another person's life. And Jezebel is furious. Her Baal prophets, her plans, her dreams of taking over this Israelite nation have been killed, quite literally. Now, she doesn't come to Elijah, who is there in the same town, and she knows where he is, in person. She sends a messenger, and she's really angry, and she threatens Elijah. You too, by tomorrow, are going to be as dead as those Baal prophets that you killed. Now, with everything that Elijah has just gone through, this little threat from this woman should be no problem to him. But what happens? He suddenly is extremely afraid, and he runs away. You ever run away? You see, Elijah, after all the mighty works of God that has happened to him, is tired He's had this wonderful spiritual encounter, and now he's physically, mentally, emotionally exhausted. And for one moment, he lets his guard down. Elijah's humanness catches up with him, and he lets the fear take over. Have you ever been there? Maybe you're there now. Worrying about something that's going on in your life. He had fear of doubt. He started to doubt about God. He started to doubt about himself and his call. And he started to doubt about others. He started wondering about his abilities. Was he really able to do this task that God had laid out for him? He started to question his purpose in life. There were other people who could do this. He was done. He was going to have no more to do with it. Yep, he believed in God, but surely God had already asked too much of him. He didn't have to do any more. And he questioned his very self-worth. Have you ever done that? Have you been there recently? If not, hold on, because you'll get there here soon. That kind of started to happen to me yesterday, right before the wedding. And I started to think, why did I take on this wedding? Why did I do this? Why did I do that? Why am I doing all this? I can't preach tomorrow. And then I got some rest last night. And in actual fact, I was ready this morning. But just like Elijah, we don't want to deal with all these questions we have in our life. And our impulse is to run. Elijah ran away from Jezebel and Ahab and his life. He wasn't running toward anything. He was running away from something. And he finds himself heading south. Because to go north would be going into other territory. He had to go south, and he headed towards Jerusalem. And I'm sure as he got closer towards Jerusalem, he realized all these people who lived there, and they knew him, and they would call on him to listen to them, to answer their problems, to prophesy for them. And that's the last thing he wanted to do. So he goes beyond Jerusalem till he gets to Beersheba, right on the edge of the desert. We may think that after all this running, he's ready just to settle down and get some rest, but he's not. Depression has set in. You know how we know that? Because his servant who has been with him is told to stay in Beersheba. And Elijah now removes himself away from 
everyone and goes a day's journey into the wilderness totally by himself. He finds a broom tree. I think it's odd that the scripture names it as a broom tree. It's the type of tree. It's kind of like a willow tree that has branches that come up. It's more of a bush and comes down. So you could go underneath it, be shaded from the hot sun, and be totally invisible to someone else. Growing up, we had a willow tree where I was first born. And my brother and I would hide under there. It could be anything we wanted it to be. And when mom called us, we were gone. We were hiding. I can imagine Elijah seeing this tree, and for him it was a place that he could hide and just disappear, and he prayed to die. Now, I pray that your depression has never, ever got to the point where you wanted to die. But thousands of people today, especially young people, reach their po that point in their life because they have totally pulled themselves away from everyone they may live around many people, including their families, but they're all alone, and they hide under a broom tree. Elijah prays that he'll just fall asleep and die. All his problems will be solved. We know that's not true. You can't escape from everything and anything. But he falls asleep. And then he's woken up by an angel, a visitor from God, twice. He's given food and water. Now notice that when he's woken up, Elijah doesn't refuse the food. He doesn't even say, you're not from God. He acknowledges the messenger. He eats the food and drinks, falls back to sleep. And then the second time when the messenger says, you must eat for your journey is long, he obeys. He hasn't lost his faith. His body is in a, a state of exhaustion. His mind is full of doubt. And so then he travels 40 days and 40 nights without food. Did he really do that? We don't know. But the important thing to know is that here... Elijah is being connected with Moses, who did the same thing on Mount Horeb, 40 days and 40 nights without food, and with Jesus, who goes into the wilderness after, he, after God has anointed him, after he's been baptized, he goes into the wilderness, 40 days and 40 nights without food. And then, much later, who appears being transformed on the mountain before Peter, James, and John? Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. It seems that to be transformed there on the mountain, you had to have gone through 40 days and 40 nights of terror. He finally arrives at Mount Horeb, also known as Mount Sinai, the very same mountain where Moses met God. And he hides in a cave. And we don't go into the part of the story where God speaks to him. We end with God saying to Elijah, what are you doing here? When we are exhausted, when we make ourselves too busy, when we are preoccupied, Fear can easily set in and turn us away from God before we even realize it. As humans, we instinctively turn to run, figuratively maybe, but we run to get away from our situations. And usually, we end up in a mess because we're trying to figure it out ourselves. Maybe. God is calling us to a time under a broom tree, a time of rest, a time to sort our thoughts out, a time to be fed by God 
and led by God. Elijah's story shows us that after he had gained some much-needed physical rest, physical food and spiritual food, after searching in the wilderness, he is ready to listen to God again. For he goes back to the place where he started and finds out he's not alone. There are other prophets Instead, all of us need to reevaluate our lives from time to time to seek God's purpose. Instead of letting things build up, we should designate a time to seek God in the quiet and silence. This scripture today is the lectionary reading. I'm going to be doing a series later on, but in the meantime, I had decided to follow the lectionary, and God had that planned for me. I read this scripture and thought, wow, God, this is me right now. I didn't even realize it. I've been going from one day to the next day because I know that next Sunday I get to go on vacation for two weeks. Probably going to come back more exhausted than I left, but that's all right. Have you ever done that? Have you ever been there? That you can't wait till that day off or that vacation? But there's something else going on inside of me. You see, a year ago, I talked to the SPRC T about needing to go on a silent retreat. I'd never been on a silent retreat before, but something just told me I needed to. A year ago, have I done it? No. Why? Because I'm running away from it. I've been here present amongst everyone, but I know that God is calling me on that. Something else amazing has happened in the last few weeks or months. When we had our clergy session and it was announced at conference, in 2016, this is how long it takes things to happen in the United Methodist Church. In 2016, when that discipline came out, there was a new rule for clergy. Um, every United Methodist clergy is required now, um, as of January 2020, to have an evaluation every eight years, not in the church, but in the conference. So we can re-evaluate our core. What a smart thing. This should have been done years ago, but now it's in black and white, and it's a rule, so people are going to do it. They say, they, experts, I don't know what experts, that every eight years, and I'm sure it's not just clergy, I'm sure it's all people in any profession whatsoever, every eight years, because of everything that can happen in eight years, there is a shift in your calling, in your purpose, in your chosen career. It doesn't mean you change jobs, it doesn't mean you move, but it means you need to reevaluate. I got a letter this week informing me, no, sorry, inviting me, but it's from the bishop, so you don't say no, to be a part of the very first, I just knew this was going to happen, the very first um, new program um, before January that they have set up as a, um, almost like um, we're guinea pigs, but a practice, but it's going to be for real, I won't have to do it again. Um, part of that first group going through this new evaluation. And when I looked at the letter, I looked at the top, and I realized it said eight years, three months. And I thought, eight years, three months? What's that got to do with anything? And it dawned on me, that's how long it has been since I was ordained. So that's probably why I'm part of this first group. Isn't it amazing that I've been having these questions in my own mind, that I've been struggling spiritually and not wanting to admit it. That I'm at that eight-year mark. And I get called to go on this retreat. However, I have called, the SPRC will be very pleased to hear, and I am going on a silent retreat. It's directed, but it's silence for a week. I don't think I can do that, but we'll see. <laughs> no comments from anybody. 
you meet with a spiritual director, I think twice or three times in a day, and you talk to them, and they give you tasks, and you go out, and you just listen to spirit. You know why I haven't done that? I'm afraid. I'm afraid of what God might demand of me or call me. Elijah was called to go back to the same work he was doing, but he was stronger for it. I have a feeling that's what God's going to do for me. But God does that for you too. When have you recently reevaluated your life? Maybe you're in a situation where you're running from something or someone. What do you fear? How are you connecting with God about your purpose in life and his calling on your heart? Let's pray. O oh God of renewal, you are constantly calling us to you. You are constantly touching our hearts and wanting to pour love on us that we can't even imagine. And yet we're so busy with our lives, we want to shut you out because we fear what we might hear. O oh Lord, allow us during these summer months to find some time, to make some time where we can just sit alone with you and hear what you have to say to us. Thank you for the message of Elijah. In your name we pray. Amen. Let us stand and sing our final song. pray. Oh Lord, our hope, our strength, our lives are in you and you alone. And Lord, if we truly believe that, then let us be able to do it. Give our lives afresh to you. Show us the way. Guide us. Go before us, behind us, beside us. And we ask all this in the wonderful name of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and through the power of the Holy Spirit and all God's people say, Amen. Amen.